I'm going to show you how to do. I'm going to show you how to do vert branches and loops, branches and loops. I'm going to show you how to do branches and loops. Branches are a way where we can conditionally execute some pieces of code and not other pieces based on some sort of condition. And with a loop, we can repeat execution of code as long as a certain condition holds. So whenever we go to Python, what we're going to do is set a equal to 10, b equal to 20. So clearly these are two integers. a is 10, b is 20. There are ways we can compare two numbers, strings, floating point numbers, and stuff like that. One way is we can directly compare them. So we're printing a is greater than b. Whenever we do that, we get false. 10 is definitely not greater than 20, so we get false. Remember, the Boolean object, or the Boolean data type, is what we get if we have a true or false statement. Any kind of comparator gives us a Boolean output. So the types of comparators that we have is greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, strictly equal to, and then not equal to. So notice that the strictly equal to on line eight here is a double equal sign. In many programming languages, a double equal sign is comparison equals, whereas a single equal sign like we've used before is the assignment operator. Unfortunately, in other programming languages like C++ and C, I'm allowed to use the assignment operator within a comparison. And it messed everything up because a lot of new students to programming in C++ would uh, essentially put a single equal side instead of two, and it wouldn't do exactly what they wanted to. It wouldn't compare the two numbers. It would just set the right-hand side into the left-hand side. So let's take a look at what these operators actually do. So strictly equal to returns false because 10 is not equal to 20. Well, let's set them both to 10 and see what happens. Now it's true. What about not equals? So the not equals uses the exclamation point followed by an equal sign. And we can see that it is true that A is not equal to B. So we're going to harness this power into what are known as conditions. Say I want to execute a certain number. So, well, let's, let's come up with a scenario where we want to execute the condition. So what we're going to say is if my is greater than 30, well, let's say 65, then we're going to say you're eligible. or social security, OASI, old age security insurance, social security. Otherwise, so you can see there's some sort of decision here based on some sort of comparison. This comparison is if the age is greater than 65. So let's take a look at how we're going to conditionally execute this statement. Now notice we don't want both to print. We want you are eligible for OASI or you are not eligible for OASI. We don't want both to be printed in the same program. Let's do this. What I've done here is I've made a prompt that says enter your age and the user will enter their age, will convert it into an integer and put it into the variable called age. Now what we can do is we can actually look at the value of age in comparison with something else, just like what we did with A greater than B, A less than B. We're also allowed to compare these directly with literals. So in this case, I'm gonna print age greater than 65. When we run it, I'm gonna say I'm 37. I'm not greater than 65, so it prints false. What if I'm 66? It's true. So there we go. We can see now that the comparison operator is doing what we want it to do. However, let's see what we can do to conditionally execute because we don't want it to print true or false. We want it to print you're eligible for OSI or you're not eligible for OSI. So let's take a look at how we're going to do this. Essentially what we're going to do is sound this out in plain English. If age is greater than 65, well, there is something called the if statement. It looks like if. Following the if statement is the condition that you want to conditionally execute. Okay, so there's my condition, and then they end in a colon. So this is the weird thing about Python is after the colon, the indentation of your code uh, tells Python what belongs to this if statement. For example,
Right, so what I've done here is I've indented line 16 underneath age is greater than 65. What you're going to see is that if the age is greater than 65, line 16 will execute. Otherwise, it won't. However, notice 17 is not indented underneath if age is greater than 65. That means in Python terms, I got here the print statement is not part of the conditionally executed statement. So let me show you what this does. So let's print out 65. Notice it still prints out I got here, but it does not print out your algebra for OASI. That's because 65 is not strictly greater than 65. Let's say 66. Now that I printed out 66, what happens is on line 15, age gets substituted with the value 66. It compares 66 is greater than 65. That's true. Because it's true, it's going to execute the body of the if statement, and it's going to say your algebra for OASI. Now what we can do is, what happens if we want to do something like this? So once again, what we could do here, and this is not the best way to do it, so I'm going to show you how to do it in a better way, but I'm going to say if age is less than or equal to 65. So hopefully everybody can see that if it's not greater than 65, we're less than or equal to 65. That's the opposite. So what this does now, this is going to say if age is greater than 65, it will print out your algebra for OASI because that's indented underneath that if statement. And then on line 18, after that's done executing, it'll go to if age is less than or equal to 65. So you can see we're going to get one or the other. It's not possible in this running program to get both. So let's say 66. Notice it says you're eligible for OASI. Let's say 65. You're not eligible for OASI. Let's say zero. You're not eligible for OASI. So you can see with this program, Depending on your age, it prints your eligible for OSI or you're not eligible for OSI. So maybe printing isn't the only thing we want to do. Maybe it's something else, like we want to conditionally execute. So whatever code I have indented underneath the if statement, that will only execute if that if statement condition where age is greater than 65 evaluates to true. If it evaluates to false, it will skip the entire body. Anything in, uh, indented underneath it, it will skip it. So for example, if I want another statement, Now let's see what happens. I'll put in 10 and it says you're not eligible for OSI. So notice both statements, 16 and 17 on those two lines are skipped. That's because both of them are conditionally executed to the if statement. And it's clear whenever you look at this because they're indented underneath the if statement. So you can see those belong to it. So that's what's kind of nice about Python is it sort of formats your code as you go. It sort of forces that upon you because if you don't do it, well, then we don't know what belongs to the if statement and what does not belong to the if statement. So let's take a look at a better way where we can do this. So there's what is known as an else statement. An else statement says otherwise. So let's sound this out in plain English. The way we're doing it now is saying, if age is greater than 65, execute this statement. If age is less than or equal to 65, here, print this statement. However, we can also sound this out in a different way. If age is greater than 65, execute this statement. Otherwise, execute this statement. So as you can see, this covers all possibilities of the integer age. It's either greater than 65 or less than or equal to 65. Because of that, we can use what is known as mutual exclusion. We can add what is known as an else statement. The else statement is the otherwise. If the if statement condition evaluates to true, it immediately jumps to the else statement and runs that. If the if statement evaluates to true, then it will run the if statement and then skip the else statement. So let's take a look if this still does what we want it to do. Let's say we're 66. You're eligible for OASI, so that's good. Let's say we're 64. You're not eligible for OASI. So as you can see, there is still that mutual exclusivity. The reason this is better is because only one comparison has to be made in the computer. And that comparison is age is greater than 65. If age is greater than 65 evaluates to true, we know we know how numbers work, so we know that it is not possible that age is greater than 65 and less than or equal to 65 at the exact same time. So using an else statement, we only make one comparison. Now, sometimes there are other options that we want to do. We want to say, okay, if it's greater than this or greater than this or greater than this. So let's take a look at another statement. We have ELIF. stands for else if. So whereas the else just is the catch-all, else if is a catch-all, but with another condition. So if age is greater than 65, otherwise we're going to say if the age is greater than 35. Okay, 
So in this code, we're going to, uh, just like in normal computers, we start in the very top and we work our way down. If age is greater than 65, it's gonna print your algebra for OASI. Otherwise, so that means it's not greater than 65, that means we are less than or equal to 65. Otherwise, if we're greater than 35, okay? So you can see we're either between 60, we're either 65 to 36 in this case, because it's strictly greater than, or we're not. And so let's take a look at what's going to happen here. So let's print out 30. So 30 is not greater than 65, so it'll move on to the else if statement. 30 is not greater than 35, so it'll move to the else statement. So let's take a look at what occurs. You're not eligible for OASI. Now let's type in 36. So let's go to line 15. 36 is not greater than 65, so it skips that and moves to the else if. So 36 is not greater than 65. Otherwise, if 36 is greater than 35, execute these statements. And it'll execute only the statement in here. So it says you've got 30 years to go. Notice how these are exclusive of one another. Inside the if statement, the if statement only prints if this condition holds true. Anytime there's an else statement that's saying, okay, you only evaluate this if the previous statement was false. Now let's see a little bit of a pitfall that we can run into. Let's say we wanted to print out a program that does this. If you're 65 years or old, or if you're greater than 65 years, you're eligible for OASI. Otherwise, if you're greater than 75, you've been eligible for 10 years. Well, let's see if this actually performs the way we want it to. So in this case, we'll enter 66. You're eligible for OASI, good, that's what we wanted to. But let's see what happens whenever we get to 77 years old. Well, if you're looking at the logic of the program, it seems like it should be you've been eligible for 10 years. That's what it seems like. But let's see what actually occurs. Your algebra for OASI. Let's see why this is the case. So remember, we start the program. We don't run any of the else st statements unless the previous statement evaluated to false. Well, let's take a look at this if statement right here. Age gets substituted with the value 77 in this case. Is 77 greater than 65? In this case, yes it is. And because it is true, it prints out this statement right here. Because it's true, none of the else statements or the else if statements will ever execute. So in this case, order of how you've done this is very important. If this if statement right here catches everything else that your else if statements are going to do, they will never execute as we've seen in this case. And this is the biggest problem with uh, getting your head around logic. Always look at the narrowest cases first and then start expanding the cases as you do that. Because look at this, this is a very large general case if the age is greater than 65. Well, okay, but there's still things I wanna do if you're greater than 75, if you're 85 or something like that. And so that's a very generic case. And so what you wanna do is you wanna specify it where all of your specific cases come first, followed by your more generic cases. Now it's not always gonna work. You have to logically step through it to see if whatever your logic you came up with is what's going to be. Now, there are other ways we can do this. What I'm going to do is we're essentially going to calculate whether you should be driving or not. We're gonna see what your ticket speed was and how many days it's been since you've done that. So after a certain number of days, we want it to run out so that you can drive again. So what we're going to do is we're going to see whether this person can drive again. So let's come up with some sort of criteria for when you wanna drive, okay? So if the speed is greater than 80 and it's been less than, uh, we'll say 120 days, not eligible. Or if your speed was less than or equal to 80 and it's been, I'm sorry, and it's been less than 20 days not eligible. Okay, so you can see if we're below or equal to the speed of 80 and it's been less than 10, 20 days, you're not eligible to drive. You have to wait 20 days if you've committed any kind of speeding violation. So you can see there's actually two conditions that we need to check. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to conjoin these by using and or or. So in this case, if the speed is greater than 80 and 
the days is less than 120. So you can see we have two criteria, but those two criteria require two different variables to influence it. So it's not just a function of the speed. It's the function of the speed combined with the function of the days. So let's see what occurs whenever we've done this. So let's say we've gone 80 miles an hour and it's been 10 days. You're obviously not eligible because here's the speed and we've come less than 120 days. Or I'm sorry, 20 days in this case. So let's run it again with 80 miles an hour, and it's been 120 days. Notice we're eligible. So let's see what occurred when we did this. An and statement right here requires that every single one of the conditions evaluates to true for the entire statement to evaluate to true. So in this case, if my speed is not greater than 80, 80 it completely skips the right-hand side, and the entire evaluation becomes false. And then it moves on to the else if statement. So as you can see, we've entered the speed of 80. So 80 is not strictly great, greater than 80. So we skip the if statement and the entire body of that if statement, and we go to line 16. We're saying otherwise, if the speed is less than 80, is that true? Is 80 less than or equal to 80? Yes, it is. Then we check the number of days, and the number of days is less than 20. However, the days we put in was 120. So 120 gets substituted in here. 120 is not less than 20. So you have a true and a false. Remember, for an AND condition to evaluate to true, all of its subcomponents must be true. In this case, we have a true and a false, therefore the entire thing is invalidated as false. Because it's false, we skip the body and move on to the other else statement. In this case, that's how we get eligible to print out for us. Now, if we don't want that behavior where every single one of the conditions has to be true, we can use a different one called the OR. In an OR, only one of the statements has to be true. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say speed less than 20 or days less than 20, okay? So if any one of these conditions is true, the entire condition will be true. So let's take a look at this. All right, so what I'm gonna do is remove this portion just so that we don't do the calculations anymore, but all I wanna do is print out true or false whether speed is less than 20 or the days is less than 20. So let's see what occurs. If I type in a speed of 30, in days of 50, it's going to print false. So let's see why. 30 is, less, is not less than 20, therefore that evaluates it false. However, remember, inside of an OR statement, only one of them, it can be all of them, but only one of them has to evaluate to true. So because this wasn't as false, we have to move on to the next side and say, okay, well we know 30 is not less than 20, what about days? Well, we entered 50. Is 50 less than 20? No, it's not. So both evaluated false, therefore the entire condition is false. However, let's take a look at this. Let's say our speed was 50, so we know 50 is not less than 20, so that will evaluate to false. But now let's enter 10 for days, okay? So now we're gonna have a false and a true in an or statement. When we join that, as long as one is true, the entire thing comes out to be true. So let's see how that differs from an and statement. Hey, remember with an and statement, both have to be true. The left side and the right side have to both be true. So let's run this. My speeding ticket will say is 50, days is 10. Notice that the or statement is true. That's because only one statement has to be true. And the and statement is false. That's because we had a false in there somewhere. So let's run this again and say 10 and 10. You'll notice both are true. However, in the bottom one, line 13, the AND statement had to make two comparisons. Why? Because it has to check to see that every single one of these is true. This is what is known as, uh, well, the opposite condition where we don't check all the conditions is known as short circuiting. So let me ask you this. In line 11, if the speed is less than 20, does it even matter if days is less than 20? No, because it's an OR statement. As long as one is true, the entire statement's true. So it short circuits, it doesn't even make the comparison to see if days is less than 20. It doesn't need to because it knows the whole statement's gonna be true anyway. The opposite goes for an AND statement. As long as it can evaluate one of them to false, the entire statement is false. So let's say I entered 50 for the speed on line 13. So what's gonna happen is it's going to compare 50 to less than 20, which is false 
Because it's false, the entire statement has to be false. Therefore, it doesn't even check to see whether days is less than 20. It doesn't matter. Because for an and statement, everything must be true. For an or statement, you must have at least one truth for the entire thing to be true. So let's take a look at how we can actually use these in what are known as loops. So an if statement, conditionally execute code once. What if we want to keep doing something until some sort of condition is false? Let's make a statement that says do So in this case, what's going to occur is do you is going to be the condition. What we're going to say is as long as the user keeps typing in Y for yes, then we're going to keep executing this code and it's going to keep asking them the same thing. Okay. So this is what is known as a while loop statement. In a while loop, we type in while, W-H-I-L-E, followed by the condition. As long as that condition evaluates the true, it runs the body of the loop. Now, after the loop is per performed, after line 11, it goes back up and checks the condition again. And we'll keep doing this until that condition is false. Well, in this case, until do you is not equal to why. So let's take a look at what occurs whenever I run this. Do you want to continue? If I say no here, what's going to happen is do you is going to get the value N, and so it's going to compare n with y. Well, obviously, n is not equal to y. So this condition right here evaluates the false. Therefore, the while loop will never execute. So we can see it quits the program. We're done. So now let's type y. And this will move on indefinitely until I type something other than y. So notice it doesn't just have to be an n. It can be anything other than y. Just as long as we make this condition right here false, it will terminate the loop. Now, in this case, you can see we use while loops if the condition is indefinite. So if we want to start counting or something like that, we can use a different type of loop called a for loop. Okay, so what I'm going to do is instead of taking a condition, a for loop takes what is called an iteration or a range. In this case, we're going to say for i in range 0 to 10. So there's a couple things that we have to show here. So inside of a for loop, the syntax is for whatever variable is going to get whatever is in the range. So i is what is known as an iterator. Range is it's essentially a list going from zero to strictly less than 10. So how a range works is there's actually, we can specify one parameter if we wanted to. If we specify the one parameter, it gives us the exclusive end. So this will go from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this gives us 10 different numbers starting at zero. If I was to specify a second number, now 10 becomes the starting point, inclusive starting point, and 20 becomes the exclusive ending point. So this will go from 10 to 19. If I specify a third number, that will tell us how much we want to increment between them. So this will go from 10 to 12 to 14 to 16 to 18 and so forth. So let's take a look at what this does. So let me comment out how many since that's not really doing us any good right now. When I did this, notice that 20 is not one of the numbers. That's because your ending is always exclusive. So don't forget this. Your ending is always exclusive and your start is always inclusive. Let's see what I do here. If I've done this, now what's going to happen is we're going to generate 10. 10 matches the starting range, so we're good to go there. If we add 10 to that, we get 20. However, that falls outside the exclusive range of 20. And notice 10 is the only thing to print out. Well, if we put 21 here, notice we get 10 and 20. So the important thing to know about range is the starting point is inclusive and the ending point is exclusive. Now this is what is known as the step, the third parameter. We can actually move it negative as well. If you see this, nothing actually occurs, right? So let's say range zero to 21, I'm sorry, 21 to zero, there we go. So notice the way I had it the previous 
spot. The starting point was before the ending point. So if we're moving backwards, it's not possible to do that. However, if we are moving backwards, typically your starting point will be bigger than your ending point, just like I've shown here. Notice we go down to one. Nothing else prints from there. Let's say 20. Notice zero never gets printed. That's because no matter which direction you're moving in a range, your ending point is always exclusive. Now there's other things we can do for a for loop. So range essentially it used to actually create a list of numbers. So this is what we can do instead of let's say my list. Okay, so we have a list inside of the list. And what we're going to do is we're going to say for i in my list. So essentially how we can read this is we're saying for every element in my list, put that into i. So every iteration of this for loop, i takes on the value of whatever is inside the my list. So let's see what occurs when we print this. Notice it prints out a first, followed by 23, followed by 76.5, followed by the entire list, list number two. The reason is because i starts at the very beginning of the list and it gets the value of a for that first iteration of the for loop. After that, the for loop moves on to the next element, 23, and sets i equal to 23, whatever that element is. So you can see we're using i to actually trap the value. Now in this, if I said something like i equals j, you'll notice that this doesn't actually change the list. What if there's something I wanna do? What if I wanted to clear an entire list? So the reason this is printing J is because I reset I equal to J before I print it. So that worked as intended. However, what I wanted it to do is I wanted to set the individual elements to J. And we couldn't do that with this because we are getting a, we're copying the value from the list into I and then we're printing that out. Because I'm working with the copy, I'm not working with the original my list in this case. So what we have to do is if we want that desired behavior, we have to step through each one of the lists. And the way we do this is we get an index. Remember with a list, we can use the subscript number is the square brackets to get me the index of it. And that's how we t uh, traditionally set a value inside the list. So if you remember, lists always start with zero and they go up to, but not including the length of the list. Since the ending point is already exclusive, that performs exactly what we want. So now if I print I, I'll print out the iteration instead of the actual element. So notice we get zero, one, two. And if you remember inside of a list, we can use the subscript operator with the index number and it prints out the exact same thing. Now what I can do is I can say my list i equals j. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're actually not functioning with a copy of the element of the list, we're functioning with the list itself. So let's see what occurs when we do that. Notice all j's get printed and the original list is reset. So essentially what this is saying is if you just want to step through a list and do something with all the elements without changing them, just do for i in my list. However, if you want to actually set any of the individual elements inside the list, you have to use the range function. So let's take a look at two other ways we can run a loop. Now this will run what is known as an infinite loop. The condition is always true. Remember in a while loop, as long as the condition is true, the loop will execute. So in this case, we're going to get true, 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 many, many, many times. And it will keep running on and it'll never quit until you force it to quit. Now what we can do is, so for example, in the first one we said, something like this. And what we did is we said, do you, equals to y. However, what you can see here is I've actually had to duplicate my code. Now my code is written twice because the very first one, I have to get it to satisfy the condition of the while loop. However, what if I don't want to duplicate my code? In fact, you should not want to duplicate your code. Duplicating code, what if I change the prompt on you? If I change the prompt on you, you're going to have to change it for every single one of the prompts. So let's do what's called an infinite loop. And then what we'll do is we'll ask them inside the loop whether they want to continue. And then inside of the while loop, we'll make our comparison here. 
We'll say, if it's not yes, we're going to execute a statement called break. What break does is it immediately terminates the loop at that line. So I'll show you. Let's say this. Now notice we have loop again, and let's say no. Notice got here never even got printed because break immediately terminates outside of the loop. In this case, it jumps to line 13. When I say no to loop again, it prints out line 13. So the important thing to know about break is it terminates the loop at that location. It never executes the rest of the while loop and then terminates it. No, it terminates right at the break statement. So break is essentially the way to break a loop. And notice I only have one prompt. I'm not using the while loop to actually check the condition. I'm just using the while loop to loop over and over and over again. Because this is an infinite loop, the only way to actually break out of the loop is to use a break statement. Now let's take a look at the other one, which is called the continue statement. What continue does, what continue does is it immediately jumps back up to the while loop. So whereas a break statement terminates outside of the while loop, a continue statement immediately jumps back up to the condition. Okay, so I'm gonna say yes to continue. What's going to happen is this if statement will evaluate to false because y is equal to y. Our condition says is not equal to, so that will be false and we're going to skip the continue. Notice we're gonna to get to got here and it'll ask me to continue again over and over and over again. Well, what if I say no? Notice got here never got printed out, but we're still inside the loop. In fact, this is still an infinite loop. There's no way to terminate this loop the way I've written it. The continue statement, instead of breaking to the end of the loop, it goes back up, checks the condition again, and then continually executes the loop in that case. So break breaks out of the loop. It just immediately terminates the loop from the break statement and jumps out of the loop. It skips all execution underneath it. A continue loop skips all, uh, all execution underneath it. However, it goes back up, checks the condition again, and it continues the loop, hence the name continue. So we've covered if statements, elif, else if statements, and else statements. Now remember, everything ends in a colon that says that's where the condition terminates and the body starts. The body are indented underneath. You have to be consistent with your indentations. If you use a tab, you must always use a tab. If you use four spaces, you must always use four spaces. So be very consistent. I would recommend using a tab. That's the way I do it, and it looks cleaner to me anyway. But as long as you're consistent with your indentations, you're going to be fine. This is one of the biggest gripes about Python is if your indentations are off or if you're using a development environment that automatically puts your indentations in there for you, it's possible that you can get these messed up. So notice if I used four spaces for the first one and then a tab, it has no idea how my indentation worked. So you have to be consistent with your indentations. Otherwise, it doesn't know how to group them. So there's a hard tab and let's just say eight spaces here. Notice that works. So a hard tab is eight spaces in this case. So you have to be very consistent. I would recommend always using tab. It keeps you safe in that case, or always think in your mind. Notice here for this continue statement, it is actually nested inside of it. It's not one tab, it's two, because I have two conditions, the while loop and the if statement. Then we covered compound conditions where we combine them with and and or. There's also one last thing that we can say is not. So what not does is it converts a true into a false statement. It basically inverts the condition. If the statement is true, it's going to invert that and that will become false. Notice the loop never runs. If the statement is false, it's going to invert that into true and notice it loops. So not is essentially a way to say, okay, if this is not this, it inverts the condition inside the loop. We can still combine nots and ands and ors and alts for stuff. Okay, so notice how that works. We can still combine them with and, but not an OT will actually invert the conditions that we can run it. Range, remember, is something that we can print, well, you don't want to print it out, but inside the for loop, we have the iterator for i. You can call this whatever you want, my val in range 10 to 20. Remember, it's inclusive start, exclusive end. When I do that, it prints out 10 all the way through 19. 
If I specify a third parameter, that is the amount that it's going to increase or decrease it, 10 to 18. Okay, then we talked about break and continue. Break, remember, breaks at that statement and jumps to the end of the loop, either a for loop or a while loop. Continue, continues from that statement, does not execute under anything underneath it, and goes right back up to the condition. So sometimes it's important that we have an infinite loop. So while true is an infinite loop. The reason is because we're going to write our if statement at the bottom after we collect input. Remember, the reason we did this is so we do not duplicate the prompt because we don't know if the condition is true or false until we get input from the user. And then after that, the input from the user will also gear whether that condition is true or false. In that case, that's why we had two different inputs that said, do you want to continue? The way we wrote it with the while true statement, we can actually only have, or we can actually narrow that down into one statement. So lastly, remember on your if statements, else if, and so on and so forth, you want to be more specific on your if statements and less specific as you move down. Otherwise, what could occur is you're going to, whatever if statement is true first, everything else will be skipped, even if that condition still matches what is going to be called. This is known as mutual exclusion. Also, remember, you don't want to put something like if A is greater than 20, if A is less than or equal to 20. If you ever see something like this, where you've covered every single possibility, the best thing to do is to use an else statement. Because if A is greater than 20 evaluates to false, that must mean that it is less than or equal to 20. And so that's what an else statement will take on. So the else statement only requires one comparison. If you put another if statement, that requires two comparisons. But we already know the answer. We're forcing the computer to make a decision, but it already knows what that decision is going to be. And that's how you do branches and conditions.